Hello, cultists, both, uh, you know, present day and future cultists. Welcome once again to another episode of the Cult of Copy show uh, filmed here in my lovely backyard for the time being. Uh, this is episode 24, and today we're going to talk about how to use negative emotions to get people to do things that you want them to do. Uh, as usual, I am your host, the Reverend Dr. Sir Colin D. Terrio. Pontifex Maximus of the aforementioned Cult of Copy, which is a worldwide organization of persuasion professionals and enthusiasts. We gather on Facebook. If you go to the URL under my face here, cultofcopy.com, that should take you straight to the join page for our discussion group on Facebook, where you can jump in. There's like 11,000 of us or something in there chit-chatting away every day about the things very similar to what we're going to talk about on today's show, so it's a good primer. If you like this episode and you would like to uh, check out more, we record new episodes every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern right here at this YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash cult of copy. Uh, if you like the show, please do subscribe. Keep an eye out. One day it's going to be a podcast and a blog and all that other stuff, but I'm hella lazy, so don't hold your breath. Anyways, uh, it's good to see you guys. Uh, actually, uh, I can tell from looking at the thing, it says we have zero viewers. We're down from one a moment ago. Hopefully more people will jump in. I know short notice, uh, we are not joined this week by our usual director, uh, Zane Miller. Uh, last week it was his birthday and uh, we missed him. Uh, but this week he is traveling to an event. So uh, good luck to him. Safe travels. I hope he has a good time. Gets a lot of business. He deserves it. Uh, but he won't be with us this week. And what that means for you guys is normally he is keeping an eye on the uh, comments and things coming in uh, in various locations. This week it is up to me. And uh, I will check the YouTube page itself for comments at the end of the show. So if you have any comments or questions, please leave them there. I would love to interact with you once we get through uh, today's content. Um, that said, I, I see no reason not to just go ahead and get started, do you? Probably not. I'm sorry, my glasses keep fogging up. Um, that's why I keep taking them off the way that I do. I'm still getting used to wearing them. We talked about this last week. I've never had to wear glasses before. But I'm getting older, and it's harder to see things that are far away. I actually don't need them to see things up close. But, you know, once you have them on, you may as well keep them on because they make your vision all super blurry and whatnot. So... Anyways, let's dive in. So negative emotions, using negative emotions to, uh, in fact, you know what? I'm just going to take them off because they literally are fogging up every few seconds. Hi. Um, negative emotions, using negative emotions in order to make people do things you want. The trick with negative emotions is a lot of time, bad feelings sort of act like a barrier. They act like a wall between you and what you want your prospect to do on request, right? Whether it's your prospect, a sales prospect, or even just anyone, anyone that you want to do something that you want them to do. And you would like to persuade them to do it. Um, negative emotions can can repel, right? And if you think of a magnet facing the wrong way and it just it doesn't stick to things, it pushes things away. Negative emotions can be like that. The trick with really leveraging negative emotions in a very powerful way is to know the right emotion to match it up with, to sort of line up your desired task with delivering, I guess you would call it the, it's not the opposite, but like the, the fulfilling emotion, the counterpoint that's going to make that negative emotion they have right now sort of reach its pinnacle and then resolve itself, right? You want to move that emotion towards some kind of resolution. It's not necessarily presenting the opposite. It's not necessarily like flipping it into positive always, but we'll talk about that because that's one of the things you can do. But specifically when you have a certain negative emotion and you want to sort of judo flip that and take advantage of that negative emotion and flip it around to get someone to do what you want, you sort of harness that negative emotion onto something and then you make it so that doing whatever it is that you want to recommend to them to do will connect it to that fulfilling 
state, that emotional state that's going to not really like escalate, not really cancel out, but just sort of change the current emotional state there. And you're going to advance it. You're going to move them forward. That's what it's going to feel like to them. It's like, okay, well, I have this negative emotion, but doing what this guy is asking me to do is going to make me feel, I say better, not necessarily better. It's just going to escalate the feeling in a certain direction. Well, well, I don't mean that for that to be confusing. It'll probably make more sense when we get into breaking it down. Uh, what made me want to talk about this is, uh, first, the cult is like two years old now. I mentioned that in the last show. Um, and it's got me thinking more about reflecting on, on what the purpose of forming the quote unquote cult of copy was about. And it was that, uh, of the people that do what I do for a living, which is uh, write sales material for companies, hire us and we write stuff and people read the stuff and then buy things from them. Um, there's sort of this weird separation in people's minds where like there's an okay kind of persuasion and then there's, oh, that's bad, that's negative, that's manipulation. And I felt like I was limiting myself to not want to talk about those sneaky and taboo subjects, things that con artists do, things that cult leaders do. Um, so I sort of created this group as a peer group to get people in there and talk about that. And uh, not that I feel like I strayed far from it, but I've been consciously trying to think of cool topics to sort of reconnect with what the core point of uh, the cult of copy was. Now, negative emotions are one of those things where, first of all, for from your mark or your target or your prospect's point of view, knowing that you're deliberately trying to engage with and change their emotional state is something most people don't like. So you don't really want to let people know that's exactly what you're doing. This is, we're talking more about um, sneaky ways to do that just by telling people different things that they want to hear. You're not really going to be like, hey, I want to turn your anger into uh, punishment. You know, you don't really want to tell people that you're messing with their emotions. They, they don't really like it. Um, but in general, people think that that's bad. Even a lot of marketing people, even though they know you need emotion to sell and then you use logic to justify it, a lot of times people feel bad messing with negative emotions. And again, I really think that weakens any argument that you might want to put forth. If there's, if there's tactics that you just won't touch, not because you've experimented with them or thought about a good way to use them, but you won't use them simply because only bad guys use them. That's no good. That's not really going to further your skill or your ability or, you know, capitalize on your talent, whatever you want to call it. So I wanted to talk about ways to use negative emotions. Uh, first of all, directly, uh, when you are interacting with people and communicating, when you, you know your target audience is in a certain emotional state, how can you tap into that and leverage it as part of your messaging? So we're going to talk about ways to do it directly. Oh, like if you're super ethical, nice, Pollyanna, butterflies, you know, uh, your farts smell like roses kind of person, <laughs> and you want to do only the positive thing, I'll still tell you how you can use these negative emotions and leverage them into a more positive emotion for this person if that's your bag. So that way you don't feel bad about tapping into it because you're going to fix it. Or if you want to be like super evil and just use these negative emotions and advance them even into even more agitated states, which usually makes them even more prone to feel weird and defenseless and buy things from you to help prop their psyche up <laughs> as it were um we'll talk about that too not because i want to aid anybody in being evil but I, I use the word judo to describe this sort of emotional move where you grab a hold of an emotion someone already has and sort of flip them by shifting that emotion to something else and tying it to what your message is well a lot of times that's more effective if you know what the next step in bad escalation is for a negative emotion. So if I want to pull you, say, theoretically out of anger into outright like physical rage and violence, I might tease you with that to sort of pull you in my direction. And then it's more effective to be able to flip it around and change the direction entirely. Now that 
I've offered you the opportunity to sort of engage in a direction you wanted to move in if you really wanted to indulge in your anger, for instance, as an example. Again, hopefully this makes sense when we discuss these individually. So anyway, like I said, I have a list of uh, 13 emotions. We're going to dive into those. I'm going to list them all first, and then we'll get into them in detail. And what we're going to talk about for each one is a direct emotional connection that you can use in your copy to pull them in based on that particular emotion if you know that your prospect has it. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a positive way to flip negative emotions and offer a better alternative. And then we're going to talk about the the sort of devious way to like agitate it and make it even worse and then use that to drive behavior just because I want you to have the full set of tools. Why not, right? You decide what is appropriate for you to use and you're responsible for any consequences. I am a doctor, but I'm not that kind. Um, so let's, I, I guess the best thing to do first would be to uh, go into the list. I'm going to look at the list and read them all. Uh, I know there's a little bit of a lag, but what we'll do before we actually dive in, if anyone has any questions or comments on anything that we've said up to this point, please leave them on the YouTube page where you should be watching this video now. Uh, and I'm going to check them in a minute. We're going to go through the whole list of these emotions. Think about any questions or comments you might have, post them. And like I said, I'll cover the questions now and then we'll cover them at the end of the show since we don't have our awesome usual director Zane because he's traveling. Um, so I'm on my own with the comments. That's how we'll handle it. Um, handling a live show all by yourself is weird. I never thought of it, but that's totally why I like radio shows have a, sh a sidekick, I bet. Um, so the 13 emotions we're going to talk about, uh, anger, shame, despair, desperation, smugness, vengeance, domination, self-loathing, fear, covetousness, vanity, immaturity, and as I mentioned in the show promo, we're going to have a secret one that we're going to talk about last, but I'm going to tell you what it is now. The reason I wanted to keep it a secret is because like, I knew posting it would get arguments from some semantic arguing type people that, oh, that's not a negative emotion. But if you use it this way, it does pin it as a negative emotion because you're capitalizing on it as a weakness. That final emotion that you can leverage to get people to do what you want is love. And I'm going to talk to you about how you can sort of capitalize on that in a kind of devious way um, to get people to do what you want. So let me hop over. I'm going to open up the uh, page that uh, should have people's comments. I'm going to see if anyone has any questions or anything before we get started. And then we're going to dive in to the meat, the meat and taters of today's episode. Let's see. Does not appear to have any comments. That's cool. We'll check with you guys again later. Now, let me bring up my beautiful face so I can stare at it and make sure nothing's going wrong. Um, anger. Anger is the first negative emotion that we're going to talk about. Uh, there's lots of situations where the person that you're talking to, the person you want to take action is already angry about something. It could be like an issue specifically pertaining maybe to your, uh, your niche or whatever it is that your content is about, but it doesn't have to be. It can be something they're just generally angry about out in the world at large, maybe some political thing or local thing or something's happening in their world that, that's making them mad somehow. And you can tap into that that anger just to give them a message and move them along because emotion is a powerful driver. So the first emotion that you can connect anger to in order to move people along and get them to take an action is if you can make it seem like what you want them to do will somehow punish or diminish in some way whoever is is making them angry and it's not it's not gonna like hurt them it's not gonna like damage them but they're gonna feel some sort of detriment they're gonna be punished in some way if you can line your offer up with that you can get a lot of mileage out of it and you see this a lot in politics where 
a politician will tap into his audience's anger maybe at the way things are and their dissatisfaction in the current situation, sort of whip them into a little bit of a frenzy and then promise that those things are going to be repaired somehow. That's one way that you can do this promising a punishment. They promise that it's going to be repaired, but also, you know, let's stick it to those other guys. Let's teach them a thing or two. That's increasingly a powerful element in at least American politics versus here's what we're going to do to help you. They're like, let's stick it to those other guys who are currently in charge and wrecking everything. Um, so punishment. Then we have, uh, it's not really an emotional state, but the idea that you're going to take their anger and if they do what you want them to do, you're going to get whatever's making them angry to stop. It's just going to cease. Whoever's bothering them is going to desist. You're just going to turn it off. Whatever's making them mad, you're going to cut them away from it. Um, and that works. But again, you have to know your audience because like, some people are angry and they want to stay angry. If that's the kind of audience you have relative to your niche, you don't want to offer this one because it's not what they want. But if your audience is someone who wear like being angry about whatever it is that's ticking them off is something they don't want. They don't like being angry. They would rather they weren't. This is something you can think of. How can you make your offer, your desired action, be a way to turn off that anger, turn that frown upside down as it were? Um, I can think of tons of ways where you would take a particular piece of content, you can tie it into something that's making your niche angry. And if that's something that they want, offering to say, well, if you check this out, whatever's making you mad might not be making you mad anymore. Check it out. That'll drive them to do it because that's what they want their anger to morph into. That's what I meant. Hopefully this is making more sense now that it's like a judo sort of thing where you have this negative emotion and you're going to parlay it. You're going to flip it around into something else. You have to know what it is that they want. Uh, finally, the full reversal, the positive way to flip anger around would be if you are going to promise instead of anger, happiness. So a very obvious way you see this being capitalized on is if some company that has lots of competitors, has made some sort of maybe very public, very bad uh, snafu in public relations somehow, right? Like they've really pissed off their customer base. They've dropped the ball. They've made some people mad. Here comes a competitor to reference that, pick it up and take off running and pick up the customers who are, you know, probably casting off of the uh, offending company, right? Because um, what you're promising them is, to swing the pendulum all the way in the opposite direction. You wanted to be happy, but instead they made you mad. Let's bring you back to happy. That's really the best positive, most goody goody way that you can take anger and reverse it. But what if you have someone who's so angry, so outraged and whatever it is in your niche, they, they don't want relief. They don't want to be made happy. They want, they want that anger to be productive. They want something to happen. This is where you go a step beyond promising just punishment. And you think of a way where doing what you want this person to do is going to make their anger actually harm this other entity, whatever it is that they're angry at, right? So it's sort of like sticking it to them and showing them what's what and you know, vindicating your anger, giving them a little bit of, of vengeance, even though we'll talk about vengeance as a whole other separate emotion. The idea with this turning it into harm or damage would be like if that company that did that customer service mistake offended you so deeply, then come by from us and erode their customer base or help us talk their customers out of uh sticking with them and trying us out, something like that, right? You're, you're harnessing what it is you want people to do to their sense of, of wanting to somehow damage the people that are pissing them off. Um, that one I, I mark as being separate and you want to be extra careful with that because you'll notice lawyer is not one of the titles, the fake titles in front of my name. Um, so I'm not advising you to do something illegal and actually harm or damage anyone in any way, because depending on what we're talking about, that could be criminal and you should consult a competent attorney before you try anything that anyone on the internet tells you to do. But from a positioning, from a storytelling standpoint, if you can make it seem like, 
whatever it is that you want people to do is going to like hurt their villain emotionally somehow. It's going to hurt their feelings. It's going to make them feel bad. It's going to cut into their bottom line and it's going to leave them broken and sad and whatever. As long as it's, you know, not actual harm that you're threatening, I think it's okay. But again, all these negative ones are used at your own risk. But hopefully you see what I mean, how powerful that can be to take this negative emotion and harness it to say, okay, well, let's turn that anger into a, a, an actual weapon of some kind. And you can actually use it against the people who are making you mad. Um, again, you see that a lot in politics um, in an escalated point where it's like, you know, let's damage the opposing party by, you know, uh, you know, making them mad or watching them dance or turning the screws or, you know, outvoting them or getting them out of office, losing seats, whatever. I don't know. I'm not that great at keeping up with politics. Next emotion, uh, shame. Now, shame is a tricky one. You got to be like a particular kind of person to mess with people's sense of things that they might be ashamed of, but it can't be avoided. That's what we do. We mess with people's emotions as persuaders. Um, people who are ashamed would like their shame to be converted into, like, I, I, I wrote down confidence, but confidence might be a little strong. I think a lot of them actually want just like a return to normalcy to where they're not exactly like, yay, look at me, but they're just like not constantly worried and ashamed about whatever it is that they're ashamed about. Um, but in a way, that's a kind of it's an escalation of confidence from where they are if they're ashamed. Um, but that's something to think about. Is that something your audience, if they're feeling shame about something, if you sell like, you know, acne medicine and people are ashamed of how their skin looks. Some people want that just the removal of, of worry. They want it to go from being ashamed to just being able to maybe just have room for other concerns, other emotions, just to get the shame out of the way so they're not constantly worried about it. That's something you can offer, and that is an added benefit. So, like, if you were selling some sort of acne cure, you could play with that emotion and say, you know, uh, we want to make it so that you're not constantly worrying about, you know, are people judging my face? Do I have to cover with my hand? Should I not go out at all? Those are ways that we would talk about, like, promising that your product actually boosts their confidence level and pulls them out of a state of being ashamed. Um, another way uh, shame can affect people as a negative emotion is that uh, they worry that if whatever it is that they're ashamed about, if it's a secret, they worry that if it's discovered, they'll be like exiled or shunned or maybe whatever it is they're ashamed about already puts them in a state where they're excluded from groups they would want to participate in. So if you can pivot that sense of shame via whatever action it is that you want to take into one where that group that you want to be so desperately be a part of is going to somehow shift to acceptance of you, that can be a big one. This is basically the functionality of like peer pressure where like, oh, well, you're a dork right now. But if you do the thing the cool kids are doing, then we're going to accept you. You're going to be part of the group that whatever it is you're ashamed about being right now that you wish you couldn't be, we're going to look the other way on that. We're going to let you into our circle. Um, so acceptance is a big one. The really super positive one, if you want to be a goody two shoes, is if you can turn shame into a form of forgiveness where people are going to basically let themselves off the hook for whatever it is they're ashamed about. And usually that's like a very, very deeply emotionally satisfying experience. So whatever it is that you're offering them, if you can give them a way to say, like let them off the hook for being guilty, like eliminate their belief that they are at fault or the cause of any of this, that can do this little trick where you're turning their shame into a form of self forgiveness. You're, you're, if they feel guilty about it, they feel bad that they did something bad or they're a bad kind of person or whatever it is, that sense of forgiveness, that making it okay, offering them some form of uh, absolution is the word I was thinking of, offering them some absolution. If you can do that in your copy, uh, is very motivating and uh, it's very altruistic if that's what you're into. 
because, you know, it makes people feel good and you're turning a negative emotion into a positive one. But if you want to leverage shame, shame in a way where you're, you're pushing it, you're going to make it have even more teeth. Uh, the way that you would do that is using their fear of the shame being discovered or noticed or pointed at and escalate into humiliation. Now, you don't, if you're going to manipulate people in that particular way, you don't want to be necessarily the one threatening to humiliate, although you, you can, that's like super harsh. That's like cult leader, evil type stuff. So we don't really want to dig too deep into that. But the idea that if you don't do this thing that I'm asking you to do, the thing that you're ashamed about might become exposed or has a chance to be exposed. And then the thing that you fear, the reason that you're ashamed, that humiliation, public humiliation, is going to come from that. You're going to be judged and pointed at and people are going to mock you and, you know, like we said, shun you. You're going to lose acceptance. You're going to be ridiculed and told to go away. That's a fear that you can prey off of when someone's already in a state of shame. And again, to use that same example, I've seen acne medications sold with that angle where, you know, don't spend another day being, you know, mocked for your pimples by your school friends. I've, you know, it can be that forceful. It can be that excessive, but that's an example of shame being pulled into an even more negative, which is fear of outright humiliation. Uh, next we have despair. Uh, despair is like, just extreme sadness. You've, you've basically given up. Uh, you, you know, you don't think things are ever going to get better about whatever situation it is that you're in despair of. Um, what you can offer people is, uh, rescue from that, which is like, I'm going to be, you know, a kind of hero. I'm going to come and give you a helping hand. I'm actually going to give you support. This works if, you're selling like a service or you're offering to actually show up and be with someone and, and offer them actual assistance. That's rescue where you are there, you are an element of helping them. And that helps a lot if that's what they want. They think if, if your person is in despair because they think they absolutely can't do it by themselves, that's the right angle to take. Another angle you can take is uh, you can call it like, like a trap door. I'm sorry, not a trap door. Um, that's in the next one. I was mixing up despair and desperation. My bad. Uh, despair, uh, you can offer them uh, relief, which is whatever it is that's making them sad. You can promise that that situation is going to be fixed. It's going to be reversed. You're going to patch it up. And therefore, whatever it is that's making them despair is going to be gone. Uh the positive thing that you can flip that around to is hope, right? So people who are in a state of despair, a lot of times, like I said, they've, they've given up. It's beyond just being depressed about a situation. Despair is just like never going to get better. We're done. Towels thrown in. I'm just going to sit here and have it suck constantly. The first step towards twisting that around to something more positive is to restore their sense of hope. So if you can, present whatever it is you want them to do as like the first step towards, well, if you can do this, then your whatever it is that's causing you to be despair, you can see how that's not absolutely true. You've taken one step out of, you don't say it explicitly like that, but that dangling carrot, that possibility of hope, of being able to believe something can change again is very important to people. So an example might be for like a weight loss product or you have someone that's tried every diet and failed and tried every exercise program and failed. They've just about given up. But if you can say, you know, if you do this one little thing that I'm going to tell you about out in the open and you'll see a result immediately, like tomorrow, then you can believe that you, you know, you can change your mind. This actually is possible. You can reverse yourself from having given up completely. That would be an example of using that as a reversal, right? But then you have the negative thing that you can do with despair, um, 
which works if you're selling like a, a preventative or a protection, like a lot of prepper stuff uses this where you actually take despair and what you pair it to is vindication where you say you're right to despair because not only is it terrible, it's even worse than you think and it's only going to get worse and worse as time goes on. You use that to leverage when there is some sort of outcome, some sort of uh, like really bad thing that is going to maybe happen that they're despairing of. If you can make that seem even more certain, even more of an eventuality, you can get them on the hook for lots and lots of action, lots and lots of um, you know purchases if that's your thing. But uh, a lot of cults to show how this is used in a super negative way use that whole fear of the apocalypse the fear of the end of the world coming in order to leverage people's despair into like well you may as well join this doomsday cult and do all this crazy stuff you're telling us that we're telling you to do because the world's going to end anyway it's over right you may as well just go ahead and like you're right it's it's done it's done you can come over here and help us because you don't need to worry about any of that other stuff that's going to happen, right? That's how you escalate despair into uh, vindicating it. You reinforce it. You make it true that they have a reason to be totally despondent. But then you give them something to do anyway. And most of the time, unless people have a good reason not to, they tend to do what people ask them to do. And if you've just, you know, convinced them that their despair, their utter, you know, giving up on the world is justified, then, you know, they don't really have anything better to do, so they're likely to do all kinds of crazy things. I keep hearing a little beep boop in the background, so I'm going to check and see if that's like comments happening. Oh, it looks like it is. <laughs> Let's see. Contractor coach. Hi. Am I'm late. That's okay. It's all good. Yeah, so nothing vital. Sorry to interrupt the flow of the show for that. But we won't blame contractor coach. We'll blame Zane for not being here and feeding me good content comments. So after despair, we have desperation. Desperation is different from despair because despair is like I've totally given up. Despair is like the edge. I'm sorry. Desperation is like the edge of despair where you're like, I haven't given up, but I'm desperate. I'm willing to try anything like maybe right before like if you're in a desperation state and you try just one more thing and it fails then you'll then you'll despair but desperation is like that edge that razor's edge so their energy level is higher they're more tense usually solutions that use this angle and marketing are going to be extreme ones that sort of have to push people out of their comfort zone maybe it's like really expensive maybe it's a big commitment but that's why they use this desperation angle because it's like we're presuming you tried everything else. We're presuming nothing else worked, and that's why you're here. So that's why we want to push you with this desperation. Now, what you can offer people who are in a state of desperation is escape, right? You're offering them the way to get out of that situation. You're offering them the – that's what I meant by the trap door, right? You're not – coming and rescuing them you're not like going to come and help them get out of that state of desperation necessarily but you're you're showing them like you feel backed into a corner but if you squeeze this way then you can get out of that situation and avoid that negative outcome and never sink into despair um so that escape is a really good one to use because it doesn't necessarily get them you know out of the totally bad situation, but it helps them squeak by and that's valuable to them because like I said, they feel desperate. They feel painted in. So even if you can just promise like a little bit of relief, you don't even have to totally reverse everything. They just want the heat turned down just a little bit because they're starting to feel super stressed about whatever it is constantly. Um, then you have uh, the really good, really positive way to uh, flip around desperation is to offer them uh, complete peace, which is the full reversal. Not only are you going to get them out of their desperate situation, but your so solution is going to completely reverse 
the negative effects that were pinning them down, right? So if they feel like they've gotten into like a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, if you can promise them a way to where, nope, we're going to completely reverse that. And if you pick this option, everything negative that got you pinned in and, and limited your choices to this degree is going to be reversed. And then we're restoring to you all of the different options that you may have had uh, versus the very limited ones you feel like you have now. That's the super positive way. And again, just like despair, desperation is identical because the way to agitate it in a negative way and further it and make it even more um, like it, like people will be driven to action because they feel bad and then you make them feel even worse, which makes them more likely to take the action, is to vindicate it, to give them reasons that you're right, your choices are absolutely limited and everything is on the line. If you blow this, you may as well just give up completely. That's why it's very important you pick this option, right? You're you're increasing the pressure. You're squeezing them even harder by validating that desperation they feel. You're not alleviating it in any way. You're really putting the screws to them to make it even more severe by educating them how much worse it can actually get if they don't act in what is really the only choice that they have now because every other possibility is just going to leave them worse off. Um, a lot of times, again, I, I mentioned the prepper market. Uh, I've seen investor newsletters that talk about like total global financial meltdowns and things. Those are ones that prey off of like if you had a little bit of fear, if you felt like, you know, well, like insurance costs are going up and taxes are going up and I only have a little bit left for retirement. I don't know what to do. I'm starting to feel kind of like worried about it because I'm going to retire soon. This thing hits you and is like, are you desperate? You feel like your options are getting limited. It's so much worse. You need to buy gold and bullets. <laughs> um, so that's another angle. Uh, that's another example, rather, of how people can take this feeling of desperation and elimination of all but a few options and really increase the pressure on that to make people take your desired action. Uh, next, we have smugness. And smugness is one, I admit, I have a very low tolerance for, for smugness, even though I guess like it kind of makes sense predictably it is something that I myself suffer from I acknowledge it as a character flaw I can be a little self-satisfied and smug about it now the trick with smugness smugness is uh, like you can think of it as an unearned sense of superiority where people just feel like they're better than other groups of people just because usually for something they had nothing to do with like I was born rich. I'm better than everybody. Some, something like that, right? Now, the trick with, with if you have an audience that's smug, you want to validate that. That's the way to take that emotion and, and just continue it along its normal spectrum is by giving people a way to do what you want them to do, and it validates the fact that, they yeah, they are better than other people, and they deserve to have that sense of smugness. You can do that in two ways, usually used in tandem by belittling the people that they think that they're better than, so they feel an association with you, and by elevating their own sense of self-worth, which is already kind of out of whack. I see this a lot in luxury good advertisements, especially when you see ones that have something negative to say about less tasteful or less quality expensive things. Uh, those are usually the ones that are capitalizing on a sense of smugness by appeasing it and uh, validating that sense of smugness. Um, flattery is a way that you can pull smug people out if you can figure out what it is that they feel smug about and then offer them examples of, yeah, that is pretty great that you are that thing. Um, you see this again a lot in luxury advertising when they do things like it's not just the commercial for the fancy car, but they show the fancy car pulling into the valet at the fancy restaurant, 
getting a table immediately having the fancy food like they show this whole assembled lifestyle that sort of escalates it and continues to throw like yeah yeah you have like awesome taste you're the best you're the best that's why this is for you you're just you're just great and you're totally right you deserve nothing less than what it is we have for you um the the positive way that you can flip smugness around it's very hard to do because smugness is one of those that's like, it's like vanity in that it's very deeply ingrained. So it's really hard to like judo flip that negative emotion into a positive one because the people who have smugness don't actually want it to change. It's not like anger or despair, or desperation where like, God, I wish this would change. I hate this feeling like smugness feels good when you have it. It's just not a positive emotion to have for everyone around you. Um, so it can be hard to flip, but the first step towards pl flipping it towards something positive is to acknowledge whatever it is that they're proud about that is making them smug, but then contextualize that among other things and diminishing the differences. So an example would be, again, like if a luxury car was like, uh, you do have discerning tastes and up to now it was very hard to resolve that with your sense of caring about the environment. That's why this electric luxury car is made for you and it helps the environment. Not only that, we give shoes to poor kids or some shit like that, right? So the idea would be, again, that's an off-the-cuff example, but you would pull their sense of smugness about, oh, you know, I have great taste and I can't possibly ride in a cheap, tiny car. It has to be like a badass, beautiful luxury car. But then by acknowledging that, you're flipping it around and harnessing it to something that, you know, has a more noble end, you know, electric cars or whatever. Um, so you're, you're using that acknowledgement to pull them towards maybe a more positive, more well-rounded attitude, thinking of other things besides their own sense of smug superiority. But if you want to tap into smugness and accelerate it and deepen it and use that uh, negative emotion to pull people even further in, you sort of want to appeal to that sense of smugness and even give them a way to, to be cruel to people that they feel superior to. Um, a, a commercial example maybe doesn't come to mind, but I see this a lot in like so-called snark sites where people sort of get together to be mean to other groups of people. And it sort of happens in like bullying circumstances. But that idea is what it's tapping into where they're taking a sense of superiority that these people have and not only validating it, they're giving them a place to be among themselves and sort of feed off of each other and make it even worse and turn it into like, like they get to turn the people that they feel smug and superior to into like a punching bag, which escalates their sense of snugness because it almost dehumanizes the people that they're turning into a villain. Um, the closest thing I can think of off the top of my head to this in the business world would be uh, fashion, which can be very, very brutal and cruel and offer people in on the fashion, a way to just utterly mock the people that are outside of the protected little bubble where what is cool is determined, right? Um, so that's one where that like bully mentality, that smugness can be sharpened and uh, used to pull people further into this culture by being even more brutal and judgmental about people who just don't get what's fashionable. And if it's not what I think is cool, it's ugly and you're stupid for wearing it. That kind of thing. You see it a lot. My wife watches a lot of Project Runway. So that's how I'm exposed to that. Um, let's see. One, two, three, four, five. We're not even halfway through. We might break this one into a two-parter, actually. We'll make this a short show, and we'll dive into uh, the rest of these negative emotions next week because I can't let this one run long, uh, unlike in other weeks, uh, because my mom is coming to visit the new baby. So I got to clean up around the house or else the wife's going to be really mad at me. So 
let's say we're going to do that after smugness where uh about like two three i'm sorry three quarters of the way through the show and uh that way we'll wrap it up real nice and then we'll continue next week after smugness we have vengeance now i, I wanted vengeance separate from anger because I feel like vengeance is a step beyond like angry you would be happy if whatever's making you mad just stopped vengeance you're past that point whoever is making you angry enough to want vengeance they deserve suffering somehow right like you want retribution you want them to to feel the anger you want them to feel the pain that they've put on you vengeance is escalated you can turn anger into vengeance but once they're already vengeful then it's a little bit of a subtler throw to get them to take action. So with vengeance, the thing with vengeance is depending on the kind of person we're talking about, some people actually don't like to indulge in that emotion, even though it's a natural human emotion. So if they're feeling so wronged, that their mind has turned to vengeance and you know that this is like counter to their character, depending on, you know, if you know your audience, what you want to offer first as a way to diffuse that vengeful situation. Meaning if you can somehow remove like intent and malice away from the party that's making them angry, where you just make it more about circumstance and not really someone trying to be out to get you, that can remove those negative feelings of vengeance that might be bothering them because now they aren't personally offended. They don't feel like they're being attacked. So then you can shift their, their desire to change that emotional state in another direction. You can give them something else to do that's not related to extracting vengeance. That's one way you can flip that emotion if you know vengeance is not a state that your audience wants to be in. Another thing that you can promise in lieu of vengeance is justice if you can make it so that the people who are angry enough to just like they've had enough and it's time to like at like action is ready to burst out of them in some way if you can steer that action toward helping them get a sense of justice where the other party is going to be shown to be wrong in some public way they're going to be made to have consequences they're going to somehow be made whole that turns the needle down, that reduces vengeance down and shifts it towards something that you can position as better, right? Because then you're not the one, like you're ready to take things into your own hands. Now you don't have to, you can let us handle it and we'll take care of it for you the right way. That, that would be an example of this sort of flip of vengeance into justice versus vengeance. Then, of course, the highest possible thing you can move vengeful people toward, and this is hard. I can't really think of a good commercial application of it unless you actually are, you know, some sort of sneaky megachurch like the one we talked about last week. But it's forgiveness. If you can take someone's vengeance, their rage, their desire to harm, and flip it around so that yeah, that other guy hurt me. Yeah, he did on purpose, but I'm going to take the high road and I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to move past it. I'm going to put it behind me. This is, I say I can't think of a way to use it in business, but I've seen it used in self-help or even just, you know, therapy and stuff where what you're doing is giving them an out from a situation that they're angry and vengeful about, but they maybe can't change. So for example, like I hate to use such weird, you know, negative thing, trigger warning or whatever, but like, like say a family mem member like abused you in some way and then they died without you ever being able to confront them. That would be one where giving people the option of forgiving that vengeful feeling because you can't do anything with it anyway. You can't have it out and dwelling inside that negative emotion is not going to do anybody any good. Helping people move toward that sense of forgiveness is very freeing. It's very positive. It's very noble for you to do that. In commercial circumstances, 
I, the only thing I can think of is if you would somehow offer someone an alternative, like after they've been burned by something, they've been, you know, they've lost, they've took a risk and they lost a bunch of whatever it is. They, they got ripped off. They got robbed. They want revenge. If you could take that and somehow parlay that and say, well, we'll take your investment in that, that you lost and we'll put it into this in some way. And when I say investment, I don't mean like actual stocks or whatever. I just mean, you know, you bought this thing, they ripped you off, you lost your money. What if I honor what you paid towards that plus a little bit more and we'll give you this new thing and you never even have to worry about those other jerks that have you so mad. Um, you can just let it go because you're going to be in an even better position. That might be a way you can capitalize on forgiveness uh, for commercial purposes. But here we go with the negative one. Um, when you go with vengeance, like we said, if you want to further vengeance, you want to make it even more negative, you want to dig even deeper and drive them, take that sense of vengeance and pull them toward you by offering to indulge in it. Again, it goes to, to damage or harm, just like anger. The trick with uh, vengeance in this way, when you pull them towards anger or harm is that again this is one that's really hard to think of in a business circumstance unless you're doing like some really devious cult stuff where you're like hey audience go like leave negative comments on this competitor's page because of what they did to this guy I don't even know again not a lawyer don't know if that's legal not saying to do it but we're exploring the emotional uh, the, the emotional spectrum here and how to drive people, right? So if you can take someone's sense of vengeance, they got ripped off by this this one customer, like, like I don't know if, if, like, say you were, like, Charter Communications and, you know, Comcast has been being beaten up in the news lately about uh, really terrible customer service. And if you, as Charter, a competitor of them, again, this didn't really happen, it's just a hypothetical example. If you, as Charter, could say, well, here's a petition to go put Comcast under oversight, you know, from some government body or whatever. Go sign it if you ended up with us because they ripped you off somehow. That would be an example of taking that vengeance and delivering it in a way that gives them that satisfying sense of damaging the people who wronged them. And you also get a benefit. You can pivot it in that way. But again, I, I don't depending on where you live, I'm sure it's completely different what the business implications would be of something like that. But even in day-to-day -day interpersonal relationships, if you have someone that wants a sense of vengeance and you want like like loyalty from them and influence over them and you want them to be more likely to do the things that you want them to do in the future, when you ask if you can deliver to them that sense of vengeance, of uh, harming, bringing damage to the person that they want revenge against, uh, it's very, very freeing to them, very satisfying, very even addictive feeling. And uh, again, gangs of like just regular gangs and, and bullies sort of collect together over this sort of idea where like, you know, uh, the idea that that you're going to give them the ability to actually harm the people that they want to harm and not just, you know, sit there in that vengeful feeling, you know, uh, you're, you're not just going to like gangs and things, bullies like tend to redirect it. Right. So like if they're, if they want vengeance against someone for something that was done to them, they turn around and take it out on someone else. That's sort of what we're talking about. You're giving them, you're giving them someone to damage. It doesn't even necessarily have to be direct vengeance, but you're giving them a way to turn that vengeance into uh, destruction of some kind. But the trick with destruction is that it's it's cathartic, right? So you can actually make people feel better by giving them a way to, to express that vengeance. And then, like I said, if yeah, that's it's a good feeling. It makes people feel good to fulfill that wrath. And you get credit for helping them with that. So if you want to create relationships with people that way, it's, I mean, it's not positive or anything, but it does work where you give them, 
You give them a punching bag. You give them a scapegoat to beat up and take their anger out on, uh, become an object of their vengeance, and then you have their, their loyalty and gratitude and all that good stuff. So I guess we can wrap it up this week on a positive note, right? <laughs> um, next week, uh, like I said, we're going to split the show in half because I prepared way too much content. Next week, we're going to continue with the conversation. We're going to talk about uh, domination, self-loathing, fear, covetousness, vanity, immaturity, one of my personal favorites. Uh, and like we said, the one that doesn't sound negative, but when I explain it to you, you're going to know why it's a negative emotion. Love. Love as a weakness and how you can exploit it. We're going to cover that next week. I'm going to do my little closing show spiel so that if we don't have any questions, I can just shut it down. Um, but then I'm going to hop in uh, to the YouTube comments because Zane's not here this week uh, to pop them up on the screen for us because uh, he's traveling on a business trip. So best wishes on that, Zane. If you end up checking out the show, I'm going to go through our little closing spiel for this week uh, and then check the comments. Um, this has been the Cult of Copy Show, episode 24, using negative emotions to get people to do what you want them to do. I'm your host, the Reverend Dr. Sir Colin D. Terrio, Pontifex Maximus of the aforementioned Cult of Copy, which is a very large discussion group on Facebook that talks about the topics of persuasion for, you know, fun and uh, personal development as well as profit. If you would like to join us, you can do so at the URL under my head here cultofcopy.com currently takes you to the join page on Facebook. We approve new members on a regular basis. If you like this show and you want to watch more episodes, like I said, this is number 24. If you go to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash cultofcopy, that is where the episode archive is. And if you want to join new episodes uh, where you can attend live and interact with myself and my usual companion, Zane Miller, uh, you can do that by uh, subscribing to the page and then you'll get a notice when we do new episodes, which are Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, just like today's episode was recorded live on a Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, that's it for this week. Stick around for a second if you want to see if there are any comments, but I'm bad at checking them, so I might miss some. Let's see. Contractor Coach says, another great show. Look forward to next week. That seems to be the only comment we have. Let me hit refresh just to make sure. Oh, weird. I'm hearing myself talk because I refreshed it. No, no other comments. So that's it, guys. We're uh, going to sign off now, and we will see you same time, same channel next week. Have a great weekend, and uh, see you in the cult if you want to discuss any of this. Adios.